from Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Uh, this video is the mark of the beginning of Book 1, Part 2. Um, but what I said in the last video was that I didn't want to begin Book 1, Part 2 uh, myself with a traditional lecture. What I wanted to do was give you all an opportunity to make a video contribution to this ongoing lecture series. I think it's important, um, being a Fourierian, that it's not just me lecturing, but that I can learn um, different modes of interpretation with respect to an analysis of the text. I don't particularly believe that there is um, a right or wrong way of interpreting the text per se. I think there are better and worse ways of interpreting the text, but not explicitly right or wrong. Um, and the text in question is Frederick Nietzsche's uh, Will to Power. Um, the notes were from note 57 until 61, so it was 57 to 61. The very first few notes of Book 1, Part 2. I got two contributions. Um, Secular Numinous did a contribution. I watched it. It was very, very good. Uh, and I also got a contribution from Love83 Forever. So um, I got a contribution from Secular Numinous and a contribution from Love83 Forever. Um, Secular Numinous did a traditional sort of video discussion. Love83 sent me via um, email her notes on 57 through 61 and I incorporated that into the lecture. For a future um, update, I will only be using notes that are accompanied with audio already in subsequent sort of call for contributions because it took a, a, quite a bit of my time to um, narrate the notes that she had, which is fine. I, you know, I appreciate her contribution. Thank you, um, uh, Love83 Forever, for making the contribution. For further video contributions, I'm going to ask that you provide um, your own narration of the notes, um, and then I'll incorporate that. Hopefully the next time I have a, a, a call for video contributions, I'll get tons, but I was very pleased that I got two, and I, and I was um, extremely pleased with the, the content that both Secular Numinous and Love83 Forever um, gave, that they gave. Um, again, it's important that you take ownership of your education. I am merely a facilitator. Um, and it's not just the case that you have a PhD that makes you good at analysis or interpretation. I think uh, both um, Secular Numinous and Love 83 Forever um, agreed on many points. There were many points of um, agreement between both of their analyses, and, and, and I'm positive they don't know each other. There were also many points of disagreement, um, specifically with respect to um, Nietzsche's role with with the National Socialist Party, with the Nazi Party. Secular Numinous said, um, pointing to the text, that he believed his interpretation was that this disproved any relationship. And I think interestingly enough, um, Love83 Forever said that she found instances where it could be used to support um, uh, his, his allegiance, if you will, tacit as it may be, to the party. I'm not here to say who's right and who's wrong. I do think it is, however, interesting that both interpretations were textual interpretations. And in subsequent um, call for video contributions, I would recommend that you put your two cents in. If you want to respond to my previous call, by all means make a video response. I'm not going to be including it in Note 52. Uh, my goal is to finish all of Book 1 by um, probably 7 to 9 days tops. 7 days minimum, 9 days maximum from the posting of this video all of book one will be finished and then we'll move into book two. So um, we'll, we'll, we should have all of uh, Will of Power, uh, all of the notes, uh, 1,067 notes done probably in about three months tops from the time the first video was posted, uh, which is going to be, I think, a remarkable accomplishment. Um, again, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. With that, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day. Okay, so Dr. Jason J. Campbell is asking for some feedback and some uh, participation in his Nietzsche Will to Power series. Uh, so this is going to be my summary of uh, notes 57 to 61 of Will to Power. Uh, so it's only four notes, so it shouldn't be too long. Um, for the, so for those of you who aren't interested in this kind of thing, you're going to want to tune out. Uh, now, I am sorry that I didn't get this done sooner, but I was in London and there was no way I could record it. Um, it's kind of like homework for me, actually, except I'm doing it.
Okay, so let's get started. At 57, he speaks of the time in which we have been thrown. He describes it as a time of disintegration and that everything is slippery and dangerous. So this is really a prediction. It's a prophecy. He's not just criticizing the time he's living in, but he's making a prediction. Okay, he's talking about where he thinks society is headed and clearly he's not happy about it. He says, a time with all its weaknesses and even with its best strength, opposes the spirit of youth. Now, what I think he means here is that well, in our youth, we are our most competitive, our most adventurous, but this is being stifled by culture. Um, and this is particularly prevalent as children, because we're also faced with the church, which teaches us to be meek and mild, etc. When analyzing this text, it is important to note that at the time of writing this text, that Nietzsche's pessimism could have been inflicted by his own declining health and inability to communicate his philosophy to his peers and fellow men. His views were not readily accepted at that time due to his stance on religion, piety, and enlightenment. Here, Nietzsche makes a comparison between the free-spirited, hot-blooded youth and the old-age weak man he being the old man reflecting on his own youth retrospectively, is in fact saying that both young and old are suffering from a sickness. These illnesses may differ in type. The young man is dying the death of his moral ideals, which will be brought down by the certainty of uncertainty, that with all his strength and courage, that he has no control of the inevitability of life and death. His play on words where he says that, quote, all of us feel the warm, uncanny breath of the thawing wind, further illustrates the heat of life and youth and the chill of death. Now, at 58, he talks about experiments, a superabundance of bungled experiments. Now, it seems to me that he's talking about the egalitarian movements that were on the rise. So you had your Marxists, your socialists, all preaching their new ideologies. Uh, and rather than affirming the will to power, they're rejecting it and denouncing it for equality and sharing and altruism and uh, fraternity and all that. Uh, and he sees this as decay. Now, as a side note, he's not the only person who's criticised communism like this. Uh, and he definitely wasn't the first. But what's unique about this is his reason for criticising it. Uh, now, there were criticisms from the likes of Bakunin and Proudhon. Uh, and if you're interested... I have a link to a video I made about that a while ago, which I've yet to do a follow-up to. Now, the difference is Bakunin and Proudhon criticised communism because they thought it would lead to totalitarianism, and it would lead not to an egalitarian outcome. So it would go against the aims. Uh, Nietzsche, on the other hand, he's taken it from a slightly different angle. He's actually going so far as to saying that the aim of egalitarianism is a bad one. Okay, so he's describing the aim as the decay, not the means. Let us analyze the statement, quote, If this is not an age of decay and declining vitality, it is at least one of headlong and arbitrary experimentation. By using the statement, quote, If this is not an age of decay, unquote, he falsely gives the reader an illusion that a higher ideal will be presented. To the contrary, an equally glum notion of, quote, arbitrary experimentation, unquote, is given in its place. Here, Nietzsche is reducing the methodology, rules, and predictability of scientific experiments to that of the illogical and unpredictable existence of man. This irony is not so ironic when you take into account that life has some predictability, as science would do. Life has to come to an end as scientific experiments are constructed to give a quantifiable result. Yet, Nietzsche could have considered the fact that in life we may be able to outline a hypothesis or weave our path to our own expected end in the same way that a chemist or biologist would hypothesize a particular result and make steps to bring about the desired result. Hence, the experiment must come to an end as life itself. Yet, as humans, we may not have as much control of our end 
as we would over a scientific experiment. At 59, he talks about the causes of this kind of men mentality. He says that hunger generates the ideals of romanticism and that the good man is a symptom of exhaustion. Now, remember earlier, Dr. Campbell talked about the oppression from the master uh, or from those above, those in power. Now, this exhaustion is from the oppression, from being enslaved, dominated, humiliated, etc. So all of a sudden, the good man is the victim of it all, rather than the one who succeeds to dominate. Uh, so here again, we have this rejection of the will to dominate uh, in favour of meekness and modesty. It is as if Nietzsche is somewhat opposed to change, changing tastes and social constructs. There is seemingly some undercurrent and implication of the biblical deadly, seven deadly sins. Words such as lasciviousness, hunger, overabundance, alcoholica, implies that the erosion of society through music, family, and the overindulgence of pleasures or necessities. This extreme is counteracted by the other extreme, that the decline of society could also be brought about by its opposite, through the lack of pleasure and lack of necessities. He is inferring that this decline, as that of the human body, is inevitable, and that the good man is a man that is exhausted, and implies that he will not strive in the decaying world, as the darkness and extremities will almost be suffocating to him. At 60, it's now... now clear as day that he is talking about the socialist movements uh, since he talks about the rise of the middle and lower classes uh, and the predominance of the herd over all shepherds and bellwethers so it's the masses rising in revolt against the masters now he also goes onto a list of different symptoms of the era he talks about the eclipse of the spirit where rather than fighting and preventing suffering we're meant to be at one with nature. Uh, we let suffering be seen and heard, end quote. And this is caked with an appearance of happiness, of contentness. Nietzsche believes that the evolution of the lower classes has in some way polluted the body or lack thereof of the higher man of his own power to will. He labels the lower classes masses the herd, and the upper classes, the shepherds, and plainly describes the so-called lower classes as having a lower kind of spirit and body. This reminds me of the concepts of social nationalism, Nazism, and racial supremacy. He goes on to list the three consequences of the herd infiltrating the shepherd. He makes a comparison between the way of the noble, elite man, and that of the ordinary man. Furthermore, the warning is that this infiltration will lead to a decline of all. The Eclipse of the Spirit, which could be described as a lack of emotional restraint and control. He critiques that the frivolous appearance of happiness and open suffering to be a devolution of the higher man's ability to suffer pain in secret and keep his emotions hidden. Two, there's also moral hypocrisy, because people wish to distinguish themselves from others, but they do this through means of herd behaviour. So they choose to do so by means of pity and consideration and moderation, which, in his eyes, aren't recognised outside of the herd ability. This is the contrast of herd virtues versus the virtues of the superman. The Superman analogy is better described in Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. The Superman is not subject to values and rules that govern the sheep. Thus, quote, pity, consideration, moderation, which are not recognized and honored outside the herd ability, unquote. Thus, only individuals who want to be the elite of the lower class need to apply these morals. These morals do not supersede his class and does not grant him access to, to the higher ranks, as higher-ranked individuals do not seek the acceptance of others, be it in their own reference group or others. As the higher man is not bound by these rules, he can, however, use them to his advantage to deceive the lower masses to his advantage. 
picture the analogy of the sheep being led to slaughter and the common depiction and um and the common depiction of wolves in sheep clothing this sufficiently explains his case three uh, it comes to collectivism again he complains about the disregard for the individual uh, in the name of the community and spirit and get this the fatherland so he's not just rejecting collectivism here he's also rejecting nationalism patriotism uh, this is completely consistent with Zarathustra's uh, diatribe against the state in Thus Spoke Zarathustra and it's, it's completely compatible with the utter disdain he expressed towards his own country in Beyond Good and Evil. It's also worth making a note as a rebuttal against people who like to blame uh, the rise of Nazism and totalitarianism on Nietzsche. They like to compare the Nazis to Nietzsche. It's clear as day that he's got nothing but utter disdain for this kind of attitude. Shared suffering is debased as being emotions common to animals that herd together. Community spirit and patriotism is critiqued as detracting from individuality and personal freedom. What Nietzsche fails to mention here is that without the so-called congregation of the masses to pay things such as taxes and protection of the country through warfare, that the upper classes and the individuals would not be free to self-rule and govern their own micro-lives. Maybe here Nietzsche accepts the role of the masses in this capacity as allows himself and the other individuals to use their ignorance and suffering against, thus sending them to fight to protect the rich, the individuals, and the upper class. 61, uh, once again he talks about how his time has an aspiration to remedy and prevent accidental distresses and wage preventative war against disagreeable possibilities. So... I think it's fair to say that uh, if he'd lived uh, in today's age, he wouldn't have been a fan of the modern nanny state. One interesting thing he does say is that our rich are poorest of all. Now, there are two ways that I read this, uh, and I'm not sure which he means, but I think they're both completely compatible. On one hand, he could be saying that people today consider those who are poor and lacking material wealth uh, they consider those types of people to be the ones who are rich in character. So like I said, the victims, they're considered the good man. So that's what he could mean by the rich are the poorest of all. On the other hand, he could be just arguing that those who are rich in material wealth are the poorest of all because of what he sees coming. So they are in a bad position here. They are the poorest of all because he predicts that society is going to rise against them. Okay, so he predicts that in the future the rich people are going to be at a disadvantage. So in that sense, they're poor. Now, like I said, these two interpretations, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but I just, I wonder what it is he's getting at when he says that. Here, Nietzsche speaks of the modern era he was living in and the advancement of knowledge and foresight. He speaks about preventing accidental distress and preventing disagreeable possibilities. This foresight and preventability may be in line with the current advancement of his times. Thus, industrialization and medical developments were introduced to prevent in the decaying of the body for some and increase the finances of others. Thus, these preventative actions could only be used by those who have money. Medicine could only be purchased by those with money, and factories would bring great wealth to its owners by decreasing the possibility of human error. However, Nietzsche still concludes that even with money, foresight, and preventative actions, decline is still inevitable. He states, quote, It is a time of the poor, unquote, and, quote, Our rich are poorest of all. The true purpose of all riches is forgotten, unquote. Here, Nietzsche makes a contrast between the poor masses and the wealthy poor. The poor masses are now able to access much more than they could do in previous times. With the introduction of free education and social subsidization means that the poverty threshold has decreased, thus increasing their status and competing with the higher classes. Thus, by emphasizing our rich, Nietzsche associates himself with the rich class and almost formulates a unity among them, similar to one that, that he criticizes in the herd masses. In classical Nietzsche philosophy, 
the purpose of all things, including money, of the rich is to be able to do as they please. Yet the rich poor have to tend with increasing legislation and regulation on how they trade and how they treat employees and other citizens. Thus, their freedom is now bound by the virtues of the masses. So those are my notes on 57 to 61. Uh, I hope that wasn't too boring for those of you who weren't really that interested. And I hope that was what you were looking for, uh, Jason. So there we go. Thanks for watching.